Before we begin, I'd like to welcome Bishop uh, Stephen Andrews, the principal of the college, to bring some greetings from the college. Thank you very much, Stephen. So I am the principal of this college, and uh, I just want to add uh, my word of welcome to Steve and to say how wonderful it is to have you uh, for this event. It's so full, it's wonderful to see so many turn out for it. And uh, we're, as Steve said, we're especially pleased to have Sandra Vaughn here with us this evening. Um, she has assembled this collection, uh, which focuses on Marc Chagall's uh, imaginative conversation with the themes and stories of scripture. And uh, then guiding our reflections uh, this evening, we have uh, Father Jeff Reddy, uh, who is a close colleague of ours. Uh, he lives and works, I shouldn't say he lives, but he works right across the street at Trinity College, and, uh, and uh, he fits in very well to the community life here at, at Wycliffe. It's wonderful to have you back here, Jeff. And it's a great privilege for Wycliffe to host this extraordinary exhibit for a couple of reasons. In the first place, Wycliffe has a reputation as one of North America's leading academies where the engagement of scripture and theology is taken seriously. We call it the theological interpretation of scripture. And in this, our faculty and students seek to understand God's word in the context of the whole canon of scripture and in light of the faithful who have interpreted scripture in the past through their theological writings, but also through literature and art. And we also read scripture and bring theology to bear on the ear to the good news of God's salvation. Not only that, but we have had a long connection with the Jewish Christian community here at the college through Dr. Jakob Yach, who was a professor here some, uh, for some 16 years, uh, from 1960 to 1976. He was a systematic theologian, but he had this deep love of the Bible. And he had this vast knowledge of the ways that Jews read their holy scriptures. And so this is a wonderful, almost kind of commentary, if you will, on some of the legacy of Christian, uh, of, of Wycliffe College. And so uh, we welcome you, and we look forward to this opportunity, not only to learn more about this remarkable artist, but also to enter into the world of the biblical story through his perceptive eyes and his skilled hands. Thank you for coming. So uh, tonight would not be possible without the partnership of Imago, uh, Christian Visual Arts, well, not just Visual Arts, Christian Arts in general organization, and its executive director, uh, John Franklin. He's been a close friend of the college for many years. We've collaborated many times. This is definitely one of our best collaborations. And so I'd like to welcome John up uh, to introduce our speakers and to guide the rest of the evening. Is it? It's working. Oh, God. All right. Well, may I have my word of welcome to each and every one of you to this very special evening. It's uh, wonderful to see so many of you here, and uh, it, it's a good indication that the arts are alive and well still in the community. Uh, we're doing all we can to promote that. Uh, this is how the evening will unfold. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to ask you. Father Jeffrey Redding to come and say a few words. And then I will introduce Sandra to have her come and speak. She said about 30 minutes or so. And when she is finished speaking, then Father Jeffrey, Sandra, and myself will sit here and have a little bit of conversation. And after we've had a little bit of conversation, we'll invite you into the conversation. Well, if you have questions that you'd like to ask, that time yeah. And when that's completed, of course, you have the opportunity either to go for the first time or go back and see the exhibition in here. So, Father Jeffrey Reddy, he directs the Orthodox Christian Studies program at Trinity College, and he teaches courses in liturgical theology, biblical studies, and pastoral formation. Father Jeffrey received a doctorate in liturgical theology focusing on enacted narrative as the formative element in Christian liturgy. 
might indicate why he's interested in this particular show. He also serves as director of Holy Burgers Orthodox Mission, an English language church that worships at Trinity College. He produces a popular podcast on Orthodox liturgy and life under the title Enacting the Kingdom. Father Jeffrey is involved in dialogue between Orthodox Christians and Jews under the auspices of the International Council of Christians and Jews. Now, all of those professional credentials are not the real reason why I've invited Jeffrey, Father Jeffrey, to be here this evening. Art has the power to speak to us, all of us, and they do so in significant ways. When we view the work of Chagall, we're coming into dialogue with the artist, seeing, listening, and responding. When Father Jeffrey and I were enjoying a cold drink on a hot day several weeks ago, he told me that he had spent many hours with this collection of works by Chagall and that he was deeply moved by the art. When I immediately thought, I'd like you to tell us about that, that is, I'd like you to tell this gallery about that. So I invited him to come this evening and uh, to say a few words about your experience with this uh, exhibition and uh, how you this evening. So Father Jeffrey Redmond, please come. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, John, for that introduction, Bishop Stephen, for your welcome. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why I'm here. Maybe I'll want something else in the next few minutes and we'll get together and figure out what that was all about. But John asked, and we come and he said, whatever you do, don't speak as a professor or as a priest. And that's not an easy thing to separate from, from who I am. But I got thinking about that. And it's actually rather interesting in relation to the way I have received this exhibit and experienced it over the last few months. Because coming as a professor or a priest, at least in a kind of caricatured version of those, would have led me to the wrong kind of appreciation of the work. Uh, it would have led me not to something untrue necessarily, but perhaps to some kind of dead end or cul-de-sac in terms of the overall experience. Let me explain what I mean. I think that professor, at least in a kind of caricature sense, would want to find in religious art an illustration of the text, right? That we would come and we would find a particular artist who has read said text, in this case, of the scriptures, and depicted that for us. And really the success or failure of such art would be how much does that actually measure up to the way we ourselves with the pictures or illustrated those things maybe in our own mind or in imagination and so forth. And we've all had that experience in the books we've read and then they get put into films, into works of art or conveyed in some other form. And we judge the success based on how well the artist has interpreted that for us. And I don't think there's anything wrong with illustrating the Bible. I don't think there's anything, I wouldn't say that as an Orthodox priest, we have icons, right, in our churches. It would be an odd thing to, to argue against. But in that limited sense, I don't think that leads us into really understanding what's going on in these works. By the same token, if I were to apply a literature of pastoral or priestly, kind of interpretation to this, I would be expecting the works would invite people to come here and have something like a religious experience, maybe provoke curiosity to go back to texts that maybe they've forgotten or neglected or never encountered, or to invite them to a kind of fuller religious experience elsewhere, as though the art were there to kind of bring people to religion, as it were. As I say, neither of these approaches is untrue. And there's a certain sense in which religious art, all of it, would function you know, in these ways. But I think bringing these lenses sells art shape. 
and it certainly sells short the wonderful works of Marc Chagall that we've had an opportunity over the last few months to enjoy here. I've had, as John alluded to, a, a really privileged opportunity to spend many hours in this exhibition. I've been there on the opening night when it was crowded, and people were jostling to get views of different works. I've been there on my own for a long period of time. So I've been there because someone happened to be giving a talk in that room, and I got a chance to look around as they were doing so. I've been there for a wonderful Jewish Christian conference at the end of June, Yahad Be'ashur, that was hosted here at Lincoln, where the whole conference consisted of nothing more than people telling stories about themselves. And for me, telling stories in relation to what they were surrounding, the stories depicted in the works of art. I've observed people, I've observed myself in relation you know, to these works. I've heard over and over again people wanting to respond by telling their own stories by reflecting on what the works have provoked in their own memories, whether that's immediate personal memories or maybe family or cultural memories. I've heard the stories of people from Eastern Europe who recognize village scenes. I've heard stories from, from Jews and from Christians who recognize religious symbolism. I've heard stories from all manner of people. And I felt in myself also the same sort of thing being provoked and sort of interior exploration, not in the first instance of theological or spiritual themes, but actually something of human experience, something of those things that bind us all together as creatures of the living God. Because ultimately religion, religio, is about binding. And these pictures, these stories, these narratives do something to provoke in us a discussion, an exploration. They hold up a mirror to the human condition, to human circumstance, and to the struggle that we have as human beings, a struggle to move forwards together and to bind ourselves together to creation and ultimately to the author of that creation whose story we live and move and have our being. And so that has been my experience of this. And ultimately that is what I think all art does and all art is therefore religious, fundamental, not because it seeks to illustrate theology or scripture, or not because it's meant in the first instance as some sort of religious propaganda to bring us to a particular way of thinking, but because it holds up a mirror to us and to our condition, and invites us to explore, to struggle, to journey, to be Israel, right? Co-strugglers on a path with and towards God. Tonight, I'm actually supposed to be elsewhere. It's the first class of a course I teach called Proclaiming the Kingdom, which is about homiletics, and about liturgical celebration, all the things that we do in order to bring to the here and now something of that future age when we will indeed be bound together in shalom, in love, in the end, all the things that, that divide us. And the only reason I could accept John's invitation is that everything that Shadal is doing here is about proclaiming the kingdom. It's about what the rabbis call Tikkun Olam, mending the world. Not because he gives us the answer, not because there's any particular depiction of a theological concept or some religious principle, because of precisely holding out that invitation to us all to ask the questions and to go to one another and to go to our experience and to keep struggling until we finally together clamber to want something of the light. And so that has been my experience over the, the last few months. And actually, ultimately, I think that's what a good professor and a good priest would be saying anyway. Because when I read the scriptures, the same thing should be happening. That they need me, that they invite me to explore and to move and to develop and to bind myself to others, to all of creation and to God himself.
And so this actually, through the mind, imagination, through the, the artistry of Shabbat, is actually bringing us to a better place, no matter who we are, professors, priests, or just human beings, which is the capacity in which I speak to you this evening. I want to just end with a word of real gratitude. Gratitude to, to obviously, those who produce works of art and continue to do so in our world today. We're celebrating Mark Chagall, but let's not forget that artists continue to work and need our love, our support, our investment. A word of gratitude for those who collect and protect art and who make it available and share it with us in exhibitions like this. A word of gratitude for those who care enough to come, to behold, to be provoked and challenged to explore. A word of gratitude to all of those who are not going to give up on this tremendous project that we're all involved in, which is God's invitation to us as human beings to, to move towards something better than what we've you know, been experiencing so far, this vision that I think Chagall gives us a little glimpse into through all of his work. So thank you. I don't know if that was useful, but John is probably in the week, so God bless you. Well, thank you, Jeffrey. Yes, it's just more for you. Um, now, uh, a little further introduction. It's wonderful to see this from full. It's great. Hosting this exhibition has been something I've wanted to do for some time. And early last year, I ventured to ask Sandra if it might be possible to bring the Chagall exhibit here to Toronto. And I am grateful to say that she was enthusiastically in favor of the idea and so would like to work to make it happen. I want to say that I'm grateful to the leadership of Whitworth College, including Principal Andrew. And I, I'm very grateful to Steve and the collaborative work that we've been able to do, uh, to Jane and to Svetlana, wherever you are, who has been in that room for hours and hours. I think she's here somewhere this evening. Uh, helping us keep, keep things together. I see very large phenomena. Imago, the organization that I'm with, Imago works at the intersection of faith and art. These two deeply human realities have come together time and again throughout history. And what they hold in common is their capacity to invite us to see beyond appearances. That's hugely important, I think. Hugely important. Each in its own way, and again, I'm speaking of art and faith, each in its own way is adept at probing the mysteries of human life and of the world around us. Mark Chagall saw the value and importance of the biblical narratives, and he found in his own imaginative way a wish to engage those narratives through image. Having this collection here at Wycliffe, at the center of the university campus, is a great gift. And hundreds of people, I've heard someone say thousands, I don't know about that, but certainly hundreds of people have come to see this work and to make their own discoveries through the art. Sandra Bob, who is our special guest this evening, is a painter and printmaker living in Chatham, Massachusetts. And in 2005, Square Halo published The Art of Sandra Bowden, where Sandra is an artist in her own right. With over 100 one-person shows, her work is in many collections, including the Museum of the Bible and the Vatican Museum of Contemporary Religious Art, where she was in the uh, 20th Century Print Exhibition back in December 2019. And in conversation today, Sandra tells me she is soon, I think, on the weekend, headed back to Italy, and there's the possibility that another piece of your work is going to go in the Vatican Museum. Sandra was president of Christians in the Visual Arts from 
1993 to 2007. That was an energetic organization that brought together visual artists who so often feel they're isolated and alone, and brought them into a place where they could feel they belonged to something bigger. She has uh, been on the board of Mobia in New York, this Museum of Biblical Art in New York City, and is currently on the advisory committee for the Duke Initiative in Theology and the Arts, something that uh, some of you will know the name Jeremy Beckham is quite involved in as well. In 2005, Sandra was one of the editors of Faith and Art, 25 Years of Christians in the Visual Arts. She studied at Massachusetts College, of art and received a BA from State University of New York. But also very interesting about Sandra, and of course we're here tonight witnessing the truth of this, she is also a passionate collector of religious art. Art dating from early 15th century to the present. Misere and Dare by Georges Walt was shown in her collection at Mobia and recently at the National Museum at Duke University. She has curated many traveling exhibitions, including Beauty Given by Grace, The Biblical Prince of Sado Watanabe, and edited the catalog for that show as well. Most recently was God Dead, Biblical Imagination and German Expressionist Print at Bowen and Calvin College in 2020. And it will come to Gordon Conwell Cemetery very soon. Sandra's collection has traveled to museums, universities, seminaries, and churches. She owns about 18 collections. And she's passionate about the arts. And Sandra, I, I want to say, I, I've waited a long time to have you come to Toronto, and I'm just delighted that you're here. Uh, and that you can share some of your rich experience and passion for the arts this gathered group tonight. So thank you for being here, and we look forward to what you have to say. Please join me in welcoming Senator. Thank you. Well, what a privilege to be here for myself. We know, um, thank you, John. It's his vision that initiated it, and then um, the seminary, Cliff, others of you that brought it together, but you didn't, didn't just hang the show. You had done everything possible. We had loads of people here and for them to all experience it. And I want to tell you, I'm a little envious of your experience with this morning. It's been a long time since I've been near these in such a way that they could touch me. You know, I, I, I was touched in Philip. You'll understand that as I go through my talk, as I collected them and gathered each one and hugged them. <laughs> but I have not been with them. You've all had the experience in the last few months to do just what I wish I could do, and, and sometime I will um, Tonight's talk is called Scripture and Imagination in, in the Eyes of Mark Chagall. John had asked me really to share with you how this exhibition came about. And at first I thought, isn't that gonna be boring? But the more I thought about it and put the sequence together, I hope we have a good time recalling how we did do it and what God has done to bring it all together. Um, for the last 40 years, I've been collecting art that relates to the Bible, starting initially it's all called Bowden Collections. Starting initially with this print by George Perrault. How did I, this was my very first print that I collected. I was an artist and my early work involved Hebrew text, biblical archeology span everything. So I was having an exhibition in the gallery in Connecticut. The gallery owner invited me to stay at her house and we would go to the exhibition afterwards. Well, I get into her house and we look on the, on the walk of a stairwell going downstairs. She's Jewish. And here is this painting heavy in her stairwell. So I asked her, what's this? Why is this here? She says, oh, Sandra, my father was the gallery director at Brentano's huge department store in New York City. And Chris, uh, major galleries were in places like that at the time. And she said, Sandra, 
would you possibly buy this for me? She says, I am dying of cancer, and my children have promised to destroy it. That was her first piece. And I'll tell you, I paid more for that piece in 1980 than we would have to pay for it now. But it launched us into something that was very important. Little did she know what the dilemma of her family would do to launch me into a career of collecting work. And understanding, I, my understanding grew. But you're going you're gonna, to uh, attest it. Uh, you'll understand that. So over the last few uh, since 1990, I think was the first Ruo exhibition that I traveled. Now I have at least 18 shows that travel now. There's another three or four in the making, and then there's about five or six of my uh, shows that travel. It's a logistical nightmare. <laughs> but in all of this, I have kept a very sharp focus on biblical work. There were some early pieces that, you know, had a landscape here or there or whatever. I've given them all to universities, and they're going to do their job somewhere else, but I've kept mine very, very focused. Um, so this was the first, in 2010, the, the first version of this show launched. And it opened at a big church in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Since then, it has gone to 29 venues. This is the 30th time it's been exhibited. And it's booked into the future. So it, I, I am just stunned. I'm stunned. So um, it includes, you know, 10 etchings from his etching series. It eventually, and I'll explain how, got to be all 42 pieces of lithographs from the two publications. And there are other pieces that are here that have been. Then, of course, two crucifixions, and we'll talk about those. And as I said, Chabot was not interested in illustrating the Bible. These are luminous. The lithographs in this exhibition are just luminous. The color radiates off those pages. It's a masterpiece in terms of lithography. But it's his uh, delightful and colorful and playful sometimes interpretation that lets the um, viewer enter the world of the Bible through his own personal vision. And it is very personal how he interprets it. Let's go with that. Marc Chagall, um, in my estimation, was the most important 20th century um, artist that dealt with the Bible. I know George Rouet Rowe is very important. He, he would be my Christian top list, and uh, Chagall, the Jewish list, but Chagall very much focused on, on uh, relating images directly from the Bible. Uh, and I think he's the foremost interpreter of the Bible for the 20th century. It is his, uh, his art is filled with his own reoccur uh, reoccurring symbols. And you'll wonder, why is that? Fish in the sky. <laughs> There's a reason, you know, he had all these uh, images from his seeing the world, from his imagination, from his visual memory that found their way into his work. Chagall's vision of the Old Testament and combines the Jewish heritage that he had from his Hasidic background and modern art, giving us a rich display of symbol and imagination. Uh, my talk today is uh, John asked me to tell you how this exhibition, this exhibition came about. So the first part, I'm going to tell you the how, and then the last part, we'll do a little bit of the why. Uh, my first encounter with Marc Chagall was at the Marc Chagall Museum in Nice, France. How many of you have been there? Isn't it a fabulous museum? This was 1986. I was taking my daughter on a trip to Europe as her college graduation gift. This was a gift of mother, too. And um, the Louvre had not been redone. Everything was dark and dingy everywhere we went. We come to the Chicago Museum, and there's this bright, wonderful, good space. 
And of course, he had painted 17 large paintings um, in the 60s, only 70s, not very large paintings, 17 of them. And he gave them to the state of France. And the job was for France to build a museum um, where um, they could house the vision and the mission that he realized these works could have. And, and I still go there. And, you know, I visit often. And I come out feel I have a feeling I've gone to church. <laughs> um, so that was 1986. That's the inside of it. These large, large paintings are some of them. And we'll look at one or two later. And uh, I think at that time, I didn't own any art. I think I bought this poster. Little did I know that that was my entree. But my second experience with Mark Chabot was at the Munson William Proctor uh, Museum in Utica, New York. And there was a major exhibition there of Mark Chabot's etchings. All 105 were there. And this was, the, the exhibition was curated by Jean Block Rosenschaft. And um, she had curated it and wrote the book. It's interesting because when my book, the book on my artwork came out in 19, in 2005, Jean wrote a whole chapter on my work because of the Hebrew text and the work that her uh, uh, university had. And that catalog, I bought that day, but it, I have kept it. It's my Bible on Chagall's etchings. And it's, you can still find it available. Now, my first acquisition was this piece. This is Rachel Hyde's her father's household with gods. And the reason I because I had a gallery in Colorado that was selling my work, but they couldn't afford to pay me. So they said, would you take a Usher Ball uh, lithograph? And I said, yes. <laughs> and um, I thought it was the flight to Egypt. Uh -huh. <laughs> and my friend Ed Nicholson said, or no, this is before I started. This is from his biblical collection. This is Rachel sitting on her father's uh, gods, you know. So I, you know, I had a lot to learn. Uh, there was, a, a, but look, look, here was another piece thrown at me. And once I found that out, I thought, oh, I've got a lot to learn. I had better start learning. And uh, Ed Nicholas and myself and several other people every year went to Paris in the winter sometime to buy it. And over the years, I accumulated piece, 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 piece. And um, of these lithographs, especially. These lithographs were all published. The, the ones that are out here today to, that you all enjoy so much were published in two books. They were original lithographs published in two books by Verve. You think, wait a minute, our original artworks published in, in, in books. Yes, George Rowe's Miserere Guerre series was a massive book that um, Ambrose Lohard had masterminded and put together. And so it was very typical in the early part of the 20th centuries, even right up to the middle of the 20th century, up to 1960 in particular, to have books that published original art. And then I found somebody in Sweden that I listed everything I didn't have. I found a gallery in Sweden that had everything I needed, purchased them, and finally had a complete set, two sets. And um, so that finished my journey. Now, it really did finish because many of my own multiple pieces of it. <laughs> but anyway, that's the lithographs. And then the etchings. Actually, he did the etchings before he did the lithographs. The lithographs are 1956 and 60. The etchings started much earlier than that. In the early 1990s, I purchased my first two etchings from a gallery in Washington, D.C. Um, it was not these two. Um, he was asked by Volard if he would um, do a, a suite of work 
on the Bible. And that was early 1930. And then, so he immediately took a trip to Israel. He had never been there before. And um, he said, in the East, I found the Bible in part of my own being. Um, I don't think he worked there. I think he had sore and he took in. Um, out of it came 105 ashes. And I want to read this quote. It says, I went back to the great universal book, the Bible. Since my childhood, it has filled me with vision about the fate of the world and inspired me to in my work. In moments of doubt, its highly poetic grandeur and wisdom have comforted me. For it, for me, it is like second nature. So in Israel, he was just filled with a whole new vision. And he turned, he worked feverishly from 1932 to 1939 to put this suite together. 1939, Ballard was killed in a car accident, and he stopped for a period of time, stopped during the war. In 1952 and 1956, he picked it up. So it was over, you know, almost a 20-year period that these were done. I love the actions. Um, they don't have the luminosity, but they have an intimacy. His line work is very delicate, it draws you in. You want to see every detail. Okay, so we told you, 2010, the um, exhibitions had started. We're April 22, 2018. It's a Sunday. And Monday morning, I get a call. The church, Mount Pleasant, um, St. Andrew's Mount Pleasant, uh, church in South Carolina called on Monday morning that this fire had occurred on Sunday and all the Chagalls were housed in this section of the building of burnt. And um, I have to tell you another little side story. When it was at our church first, all the men in the church were Patrick and Sandra. What if something happens to this? You know, what are you going to do? We have to worry about its value, the risk. And I remember saying at the time, Wait a minute. The risk, real risk, is Bob's nephew, who's in Niger as a missionary. They are building church after church. And every day, the United States government calls them and tells them that we're both up to this. And they have four little children there. And I said, that's risk. Well, when the call came in the morning, I went back to the back. Because, well, and I thought, I, I'll tell just what I told the church. Well, my life is not going to change. They, they are, you know, my life is going to go on even without these. Well, look at it. The firemen told the congregation that they gathered. And you need to know that many in the congregation were artists because that church administered this, particularly to artists. The, the firemen told them there'll be nothing coming out of here. That By late afternoon, the firemen walked out with 58 of the 59 pieces. And they were sopping wet. And the artists in the church knew exactly what to do. They stripped off the frames. They um, took off the mats. And they laid them on tables in another part of the building. And they called me on Monday morning. And Tuesday morning, I was there brought and early. <laughs> it was about a three-hour trip up. But they had uh, um, organized a conservator to meet with me and the newspaper. So we just got, decided what to do. And that was in April. October 18, a show opened in Dallas, Texas, with all the things in here. I replaced one, the one that was so damaged it couldn't be restored. And the truth of it is, I have never cared about the value of the art. I don't really care. Uh, I, I care about how much I pay for it. And I'm very frugal about that. But I don't care what its end value is. And so some of the pieces I bought, and I knew this, were not the highest quality. There'd be a little rip in this corner, a little bit. I didn't care. 
But what I was concerned about was the narrative, the story, the impact that it could have. It didn't need perfection to do that. Well, when these pieces came back, they were almost perfect. <laughs> they were better, and this is what you have here, exactly what came out of that fire. So the story was better than I originally thought when I got to thinking about it. Um, there I am examining one. That looks like it's the um, back of a piece. You have it at least when it's in the hand. Um, but when this first happened, I was a little, uh, I, I was a person of little faith. I ran out, you see this, the blue, that's the cover of the book. I ran out and bought another 17 pieces in a day or two. Thinking, well, if they get them, so I can go buy them. <laughs> we didn't need it. Um, the next two or three that I want to talk about are the Shigal and the crucifixion. Um, how many of you have read My Name is Asher Lev? A lot of you. I met Kalim Potar when he gave his talk, and I went to him and I says, Shigal is Asher Lev, right? And he looked at me and sort of nodded his head. And Jonathan Wilson, who's written on his life, said, of course, this is Mark Chagall. They're fleshing out. It isn't the narrative, exact narrative of Mark Chagall, but it's the what happened to Mark Chagall for the creation of these crucifixions. Um, how does a Jewish artist go about why creating crucifixions. You know, there's been a lot of discussion about this over the years, and it's been avoided in many places. The Jewish Museum in New York City did the best, of, a phenomenal job, a major exhibition that they put together, and I have the book on it here, I'll show you in a minute. They hit it head on. He has done well over 100 crucifixions, and he did many in the Donner and Child. You know, why? Well, part of the reason was he lived in a town that was full of Orthodox churches. And he grew up in a community where they, he didn't see art. It was a Jewish home. They didn't have the art. And his father was pretty much against him having anything to do with it. But his mother, uh, she dug up some money for him to go to public school. And she let him sneak out of the house some of the time and go visit the Orthodox churches. We think that's where he was introduced to the visual arts. That's where he was introduced to the crucifixion. That's where he would have been introduced to a lot of the images of the Bible that was in an Orthodox church. The whole of creation, from creation through to um, uh, the crucifixion, the resurrection, etc. All of the story is encased in that building. So we think that's where some of the influence came. Now, uh, the, the exhibition before here was at Duke Seminary, in their big chapel. Ch uh, Duke University has a major, big chapel. Then they've gone to Rio. And it's almost like a cathedral. And they, the seminary, uh, under the guidance of Jeremy Begbie and some others contracted to take this Chagall exhibition earlier this year and have it on their campus. And they've got a wonderful hanging system where it wraps around the sanctuary. They mounted the show and were all excited. People started pouring in. They had six and seven hundred people some days to go through that exhibition. Well, that was the seminary. The theology department of the university protested that there were two crucifixions in the show and take them out. And the chaplain took them out. And it makes me aghast because here's the Jewish Museum who put on a whole exhibition that focused on what I had done. And they, I, I gave them the name of Vivian Jacobs, who was the woman. I don't know the time period, it was when Chagall was alive, that founded the Friends of Chagall in the United States. And she was a dear, dear friend 
of Marchival and actually traveled for him sometimes when he got sick near the end of his life. She came and she's now 87. So she gave us a talk. She stumbled a little bit and she's getting older. It was fantastic. In the back row was the theology department of the university, and she spent almost the whole day talking about the crucifixions that Archibald did and what they meant. She said, you know, there's a difference between the Jesus, the new, the, the Christian crucifixion, the Christian uh, uh, Jesus on the cross as redeemer, as whatever that um, he saw this more from a Jewish perspective, that Jesus was Jewish. And in Mark Chabal's paintings, um, he, uh, Christ is wearing a prayer shawl. And, uh, well, we know Mark Chabal had friends in Paris when he lived there who were Christians, they were from Russia and really pressured him to, about his faith. And he kept resisting, kept resisting. But the irony is, at the end of his life, he married a Christian woman, uh, a Jewish woman who had become Christian. We, there's so many things that are ambivalent about Chagall's life that we don't know. We can't put our finger exactly what did he mean by this and what did he mean by that. I think we just have to leave that to <clears throat> but in the life of the <clears throat> powers that be and these great German scholars that do, take a look at this crucifixion. What is written above Christ's head? Can you read it? It says Chagall. It doesn't say Jesus of Nazareth. It says Chagall. He, he lived, he didn't fit wherever he went. He didn't fit in Russia because he was an artist. He was doing. He didn't fit in Paris, even though he experimented. Um, he struggled almost everywhere he went, and um, <clears throat> he felt that he had a life where he was <clears throat> pretty much crucified <clears throat> or suffering. So he took the crucifixion in this in this incident. His name is above it, and the, notice the clock is his hand. We see that with him quite often. The clock is time. The fish, we as Christians, can associate that with Jesus. But probably from Mark Chagall, he associated that with his father, who uh, sold fish. Um, you get a hint of his village in the background. You see candles. See the candles up in the upper, right, upper left corner? that I'm sure gets back to his Shabbat. Um, this is a wonderful little piece. So it's very personal. <clears throat> this is another one called the mystical crucifixion. It's a, and so it's, um, this is a good segment for me to touch a little bit about slide, but anyway, this is called the mystical crucifixion. He was born in Vitesse, Russia, as we know. Um, this piece is absolutely packed. Look at the Madonna and child. You've got the crucifixion. You've got his little village. You've got the candlesticks. You've got the clock. You've got his village. You've got a man flying in the sky. Characters flew. He turned themselves inside out because Mark Chagall felt that the, the imaginative world, the mystical world, was as real as the physical world. You know, in our creeds, we say, we just talk about making visible the invisible. Mark Chagall did, making, making seeing the unseen. So we have to have, um, we have to have a little playful spirit to go along with Chagall in these pieces. Um, this mystical crucifixion, because it touches on the fact, I'm just going to take about four or five minutes to give you a little summary of his life. This is Sandra's condensed version of Mark Chagall. He was born in 1887 with the test. He was the oldest of nine kids. His father sold hearing. He was educated in a, in a um, 
to a school until his mother gathered together enough money to put him in a public school. He met somebody who was drawing and was an artist that inspired him. And um, I mentioned that he was in and out sometimes every Orthodox church. And that was 1887. In 1908 and 10, he goes off to St. Petersburg to study art. Well, there he sees Gauguin's work, and he hears about Paris. He goes back to the test. He meets Bella, his someday wife to be. The romance lasts for a long time. Uh, he meets her, but he decides he needs to go back. He needs to go to Paris. So he goes to Paris. His studies are. He's in the Louvre this year. He he um, he became very intimate and interested in Rembrandt. Um, he didn't fit in, he didn't fit into the pubis, he didn't, just didn't fit. He kind of always had to do his own thing. Um, and uh, so that's why he, he was alone a fair amount of the time. Um, he remembers at that time he was painting his dreams. And that's the time when you saw people floating in the sky, you saw the lovers, you know, he's thinking back to Bella. Um, the fiddler shows up, reminiscing about his home. Um, and then he returns to Mutesk um, in 1914. In you know, 1915, he marries Bella. Um, he's there a few years, until 22, 23. And he, he takes Bella and he goes back to Paris. But he stops. Um, he leaves, he leaves Mutesk, decides to go back to Paris, but he goes via Berlin, leaves off uh, 160 gouaches and 40 canvases, goes to Paris. And eventually he returns to Paris. And then he's decided he's got to get out of there from the war. He returns, uh, well, that's when Ballard asks him to uh, do the etchings. World War II comes. He does not believe anything's going to happen to him because he's too important. But he does move south. And he realized he was arrested by the Nazis. And our government stepped in and told him they better let him loose because he was too famous and they would be in trouble. He was in prison for three days. And then we got him to Portugal where he went to the United States. And um, Montreal's son, Peter Mondrian met him and brought him, um, got him into New York City, had a gallery, set him up there. Um, so he was literally rescued by the Americans, but the Americans rescued a lot of people. Then in 1943, the war was terrible. He heard about his town being burned. And um, that's when he started making crucifixions at a pretty good rate. Now, this is the white crucifixion, probably one of the most famous that he has. It's in the Chicago Art Institute. This is the only crucifixion I know that he did where Abraham and Isaac are not. Usually those two images are, are tagged together. But here you can see his village burning. You can see houses turned up and down, upside down. You can see it being, the town being invaded. Some are getting in a boat to escape. A man at the bottom has the Torah in his hands, and he's, he's leaving, protecting the Torah to take it with him. The, the uh, candles are there, and Christ is in the middle of everything. So that, that's my little synopsis of, oh, well, I did tell you, and one after he did, after the war came back, even before that, he returned to Berlin to pick up his artwork, and it was all sold, but there was no money left. So he got nothing for it, and when he went back to Paris after the war, he found that uh, his paintings had even been used to build dog houses. There was nothing there. So he went through a lot of loss. Um, <laughs> I want to read two quotes. Since my early years, I have been fascinated by the Bible. It has always seemed to me 
still that it is the greatest source of poetry of all time. Since then, I have sought this reflection in life and in art. The Bible is like an echo of nature, and the secret I've tried to transmit. There's one other quote that several of you, I think, have used. Chagall said, he said, he did not see the Bible. And we know that from even looking up some pictures. He dreamt it, even as a child. So his work, his images have some of that ability of imagination, dream quality. Uh, I want to end by showing you how he fleshed out the Bible in uh, two pieces that are in Chagall Museum in southern France. So, Okay, in this one, this is the creation of man. He starts with Genesis and goes all the way through the Old Testament in those 17 themes. Now, last year in June, I took my whole family to Southern France for my dog and her family. And uh, our, our family has been there before, but the in-laws had the grandchildren's spouses and my daughter's husband. So I said, okay, before we go, Granny has to give at least a 20 minute talk. <laughs> and because you're about to, uh, about to interpret these. And oh my Lord, to my imagination, the grandsons in law, the granddaughters in law, and my son in law, who never wanted to go to a museum, was totally lost. Um, look at this creation. Um, the angel has this transporting animal. But look at the look at the sun. This, this sun swirls, throws into creation, sets the spiral going, and looks to the future for every for everything from Adam. Look, there's a crucifixion. There's a um, the Ten Commandments. Can you see that in the corner? Um, there's uh, people praying. There's a ladder. There's people traveling. It's fishes in the sky. Um, every, it's the unfolding of all scripture. He infused into this herb of peace from Genesis 1. And I, those, um, they're not kids because they're 30 year old grandchildren now. <laughs> they're a little older. They couldn't take, they, they were practically taking notes at how much he infused into these pieces. And then another one that I love to see is Abraham and Isaac. And um, we know the story. The angel, Abraham is about ready to take the life of his son. And an angel appears out of the sky. Don't we love his angels? I've come to realize that I think he studied Jotho. Because sometimes Jotho's angels had heads and knees and no bodies. That's practically what we said, too. Um, over in the corner, to the left, your left, you know, I don't know who the woman is by the tree. Is it Sarah? Did she, is he imagining that she was suffering, knowing where they were going? And there's a, a ram behind the tree. But go up in the upper right corner. What do we have there? We have a Madonna and child on the extreme right. But we have the crucifixion. He has tied these two together, sacrifice. The sacrifice of Abraham to the sacrifice of Christ. Um, I think that's really pretty significant, how he understood. He may have been Jewish, but he understood the implications even of Christianity. He, he lived in a world that crossed a lot of those barriers. And that's why I think his work can cross those barriers. Um, I want to share with you two books, one by, if you like it. One of them is Mark Chagall by Jonathan Wilson. He is from Boston. It is the first book I ever knew that really dealt with why Chagall did crucifixions. Um, and then, Chagall, Love, War, and Exile. 
That's the book that was put out by the Jewish Museum in New York City for that major exhibition. That is a wonderful book to read. Not difficult, but uh, in, you know, I would love to send a copy to that theology department. <laughs> <laughs> They don't understand how much far they've given. <laughs> um, it's my hope that this exhibition may enhance your admiration of Shabbat, but also that the scriptures are made more real, more alive, through the eyes and an imagination of one of the greatest biblical artists of the 20th century, Shabbat. As I said, we don't all know exactly what he believed or didn't believe. We can dissect them theologically, and thank God we can. We can enjoy him. But you know, we know he's loved. He's loved by the world. This is his burial site in, in um, St. Paul de Vence. And when you go down to the cemetery, every time I go, there's this, look at the heart. And people have spontaneously left these um, demonstrations of their love. And I hope that this exhibition helps you come to that place of appreciating. Thank you. Thank you very much. My personal journey. We have some time for uh, just a bit of conversation, and I'm going to ask you a little bit. Um, so, again, uh, in terms of raw Chanel sentiment, it's clearly a biblical story. So what about his rendering of the story? Say something about that and how that is. Say it a little more. Well, it's not sensitive. <laughs> it's not. It leaves a lot for you to imagine and for you to fill in. And it really requires that you have some help. Or that you go, I, this, this show was at the church in Kentucky, and I remember people, oh, I've got to go back and read some of this stuff. So that, that would be a good thing, too. It awakens people to think afresh about the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see it in a new and different way. Yes, we will. Images are important in education, and yeah, they're very important to you. Uh, what? Why is you can say what we want to do? Why do we need some faith? Good faith, right? Is that it says a beautiful thing about making the other things exist. Yes. Yeah, but like making that which we can't comprehend somehow accessible. Well, for those of us who are Christians, we believe that's actually a step God himself took with this foundation. Mm -hmm. But the, the one who is beyond us, all thought, beyond all expression, beyond all knowledge, somehow communicate with yourself in a way that we would be able to appreciate that. Not obviously exhausting the mystery. Yeah. So in the foundation of the Orthodox Christian ideology and geography is the is the foundation. And so you know, so I would sense that the work of the Archdiocese. No, I think mean, in some ways it's very happy with that. Yes, yes. So sneaking into churches, sitting with me at Moy, and seeing like that was always the Archdiocese. But the sense of it, you know, all this stuff was going to be in the sense. But again, I think you have a proper appreciation of what was like. It's not saying this is an illustration of the life, but it's only a mark of interaction. You know, they, they will say all is there in the essential, you know, like, but which obviously wasn't the case. So it, it's, it's a dream. You know, it's like it that is a tradition. It's that, it's that way that proof is conveyed in ways that are very difficult to convey. The closest thing we can tell the words is poet. Right? So it's not in rational discourse and propositions, but in 
poetry was even better. Well, Picasso said, art is a lie that tells the truth. Yes, it's a flat surface. Um, it, it twists things, it changes, but it, gets, it can get to the truth. It doesn't just copy the reality, but it somehow enters into a fresh way in a different way, which can be very engaging for us. Uh, you said that this is number 30 for the uh, Chagall. Mm -hmm. Just say a little bit about how it's been received in our setting from who you get in a common story. And where you come so yeah, well, it's, I encourage you just to use this as an outreach to the Jewish community. And there is one beautiful story in Lexington, South Carolina, Lexington, Kentucky, where an Anglican church took it and they decided to put a man in the paper. And they got a call from a professor at the university in there and said, I'm Jewish and I'm a scholar and I'm Chagall. I'd be glad to give you a policy lecture. They didn't even plan. 150 Jewish people came for that lecture in a, a class of it. And um, in the process of the evening, they found this elderly Jewish man over in a corner weeping. And they said, you know, could we help you? He says, this is the first time I've had a rich, good experience in church. So those stories, I came up with a small number in this war. The question for each of you, one of the things I sense in Chigal's work is that there's a bringing together of suffering and joy. Mm -hmm. There's a great joyfulness also. But then you also sense that there's, there's an undercurrent of sadness and suffering. Can each of you comment on that? Yeah, that's a good question. Truth to the lie is captured, right? It would completely be true to our human experience without having burning villages or crucifixions or depicting refugees and suffering and the horrors of sacrifice and so forth. My sense with Shabbat is the joy that's there is almost carnivalous. But I mean, it's literally saying that because the carnival is, it's a kind of inversion, right? In, in carnival, the, the high and mighty are brought down, the rich are made poor, and then the opposite. Really are filled and the low are brought up. It's a very biblical idea. I mean, in the Old Testament had a song request that, and then Mary herself picks up on that in the New Testament, right? The, the, really, what the Torah has a lot of words for is right? the New Testament, the idea that in the midst of the horrors and suffering of life, something can be snatched that ultimately tells something of the finding. Story, which is a story. So it's not so much a mix of something you enjoy that I see, but it's a, it's a facing up to the reality of suffering with this possibility of reversion. Everything is suddenly turned around. And that's what's you know, that's the that's that kind of provocation I was thinking about earlier, but draw in a stream to the possibility of something that you could test. Yes, yes. Which which we don't expect. We discover it. Certain moments. Absolutely. We live your life without it, and we need people to remind us of the possibility. Yeah, maybe ships and suffering and hope. Yeah. You want to talk about Yeah, I am. Yeah. Well, I got that one up to and said about there's a few pieces in this is true, the creation, but it's about people, yes. it's about individuals. And everyone removes a name. We know the struggle that they have. We know the struggle they have. We know the struggle of um, every single character. Look at, look at the one, one of them we love the most, David and Bathsheba. That phenomenal piece, that's the horrible struggle. Sin, good, but somehow beauty. Um, so I, I think, yeah, that, that their lives had that. He was drawn to those characters. He was drawn to the people. 
we don't see too many landscape looking at Jerusalem or we see the people, the, the story in the Bible unveiling itself through the life. And particularly women. He has a strong place to live. I think also that Fushigawa is not the part of the individual, but it's a sense of up togetherness here in Los which is what, what you're saying. Well, maybe uh, we, we could open it up for uh, some of you to raise a question and comment. Julie will have the, uh, the microphone, and I would invite you to give me a question brief and direct it. Well, maybe it'll be open to the audience. Yeah, I'll just say that I think the first thing that comes to mind is the Bible and 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 the Bible. I'm curious to know um, to what extent your own art has been influenced by Shiva. And that's my first question. My second question is, what do you hope at the end of the day this tour of his work will do and will convey to those who see it and spend time with it? I can answer that last question very easily. Exactly what's happened here tonight, and what happened in that church in, in Lexington, um, and even what happened in Duke with the professors ripping away the first selection, but the dialogue that came about after. Um, I hope that people are pushed to think a little bit, and I hope I, I, I pray that they're um, they have spiritually respond to this work. That it can feed them. And Chagall impacted my own work. I can't put a finger on it. Um, I, I don't see that. However, I can see my own, I can see my collecting of, of as an extension of my own art because I hope my work does the same thing I hope this does. Guys, thank you for bringing this beautiful exhibit to Toronto. Um, you said that the crucifixes were removed from the university exhibit, and I just don't understand why they were removed from the exhibit. Because the professors in the theology department of the university thought that they might be offensive to, to, who? to whomever came, and that some would be confused that Chagall did a crucifixion. We well, had to be, you had. You could know nothing about art and not know that he did all those three predictions. You know, so it, it's mind boggling. Well, it seems there was an yeah, like, yeah. informed decision on the part of this. So, people in the park. Please go ahead. Well, thank you very much for uh, both the wonderful exhibition and uh, the talks that we're seeing. Uh, I have a question that's coming from the Shadal in Paris. Harrison and Michael Gurney's foreign city city was really the center of major uh, renovation of the uh, post house technology. You mentioned Chaos uh, early content, in fact, other sorts through all your experience. And do you know if there's any contact uh, between Chagall and the reading of Post House technology based in Paris? No. No, I don't. Just sort of stay away from you think all of us. And it really stay away from on that particular and on that community. So no, um, he had contact with a couple who were artists and um, had been to were from Russia and changed to Christianity. But you know, he really was pretty much alone. He was not in England in the way many of them were. So to my knowledge, I, mean, I can't guess it. No, I am not a scholar, I tell you, I'm just a monk. It's the truth. Thank you very much for your talk tonight. Um, as you were speaking, I couldn't help think of another Jewish artist, um, and that is Leonard Cohen. 
and he comes from Jewish roots. And there's so many images, biblical characters in his, in his lyrics. And um, it was very helpful to hear him talk about how Shigal imagined the Bible. And I think that's, that's a great way for me to start thinking about when I'm talking so hard. Well, another important artist from the 20th century was um, Ben Zion, who you know, you don't know his work, but he had thought whole suites of the Old Testament black and blue actions that are pretty powerful. He was part of the 10 out of New York City, out of New York. Thank you again for the wonderful presentation. I'm fascinated to learn more about the fish in the sky and what that symbolism is all about and how that maybe does that happen in the tiles as well. The fish, the, the fish symbol. Yeah, well, the fish recalls his father, who was a hairy fish symbol, I think. I think it was hairy. I might have lost her. And um, so I think that brings back Tyree's background, his roots. And, you know, whether he knew that fish was a symbol in Christianity, we can just guess, we can imagine. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that, but he was very poised. He didn't want to tell you what all the symbols were. He very carefully would tell you, no, you've got to figure that out. So it's left you. And you know, I think that's one of the reasons the church didn't embrace the visual arts. They couldn't have total control of it. You, you, will, you see it. You can interpret it. Something that's written, they can guide you through exactly what they want you to see. But in the visual arts, you're open for interpretation. So that's a little more frightening to authoritarian. <laughs> Um, churches in a way. So I think it's taken years for us to break out to be more holy. We, we need to have the argument of your receptivity rather than control. Now, a lot of people would like to come to everything with posture and control. What's going on here? I'm not sure they like it. Where is it going? But if you're receptive, then you can have some wonderful surprises. You can bless your hands. I'm curious about his um, relationship with the Jewish interdiction against figurative art. He went his own way. You know, he was he was not somebody that anybody had partners. He had a calling, and he followed that calling. George Ruaba was another one who followed that calling. Sadawadanabi, the same thing. They said you can't do this. But he, he understood what he had to do in his own. Just to let you learn to take more about your talk, the story of Moshe is that story, right? One who feels that vocation, that calling, that gift within himself, and ultimately the, the suffering and struggle within his own community. That's just a picture of different things. He himself mentioned all this. He feel about this picture. It's painful to experience that emotion or to knowing the deception of certain parts of it. No, my own background, at, 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 about 17, 18 years old, I remember sitting at the table with my grandmother and mother saying that I wanted to be a nurse. Immediate response to what would you ever do with that? Imagine my life without it. No, they liked hand work. They appreciated a lot. My dad was a fabulous carpenter, built Norman Rockwell's studio. Uh, unbelievable things, but to imagine being an artist, what would you ever do? Can I just say, in relation to that, we might think that we don't do the same sort of thing, kind of shutting people down or inhibiting the arts. Just for the many ways that it's marginalized and undercut. We've got to be in the film, so in the program. Art or music, 
Uh, I think that's a symbol of sacrifice. Is that I don't think it's a lamb. I think it's more like a bow of the Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. Well, he, I want to go. I don't want to do that. When he got to New York and yeah, Montreal's met, met him, one of the first questions he asked when he landed in the United States do they have cows here? Uh -huh. <laughs> Because see, they were part of the same tree. I'm sorry. I was wondering, did he sell them in connection with his post-war land investments? Oh, that's He would not have put Abraham and Isaac up and refused to set them up as investors. Can I say one other thing to all of you? One of the ways you can shun is by saying, I could never do this. I could never. I want to ask you, when somebody enters your home, do they know who they're sick? When you enter a Jewish home with a mezuzah by the door, when they enter a Christian home, can they tell? Is there something in your home that designates this is a home of people of faith? And then the other thing I want to tell you, that even these shagals out here are not that expensive. And my friends, and I'm telling you, you could all be collectors, because my friend says, if you own two, you have a couple. But as soon as you have three, you have a touch. Uh -huh. It's great. Thank you, everyone. Um, that question is in the line with the art, Nick Dave. Because you indicated in the start of the talk that you maintained a very focused vision of what your collection was about. Yeah. So I was just wondering why did you do that? And what's the name? Well, not everybody has to focus, but I had to focus because if I had not focused, our collection would have nowhere near the impact it has. Yeah, and there's nobody that's traveling religious exhibitions the way I am that are so inexpensive and available to churches. Um, and um, I wanted that to happen. You know, I want. Uh, I don't believe we can expect to impact the world without the visual art. We live in the visual art. We live in the age of the iPhone. We have all of our computers. Um, but we have to be educated ourselves in order to impact the rest of the world. It's critically important that we have a visual vocabulary. You know, um, I travel all over Europe. Um, and I went to visit churches of my mother's families. And every little church looked horrible from the outside in this part of England. You went inside and it was horrible. And there were signs up there that said to the door. Um, we have lost that vision. These are not, I don't, I told you, I don't care what they cost or how valuable they are. I care what they're saying and how they can impact. And I care about living with them. And I care about reading scripture. And I say, when I hear, when I read the story of the Annunciation, read thousands of pictures of the Annunciation that go in front of me like this, that are illuminating and magnifying their text. I only wish that for all of you. It, it, it enlivens the scripture. I think tonight we've, we've been invited to be people of sign and symbol, with as much of that inscription to go beyond just a literal word or whatever, but, but to go to sign and symbol with so powerful. Well, I want to thank you, Jeffrey, Ralph, Sandra, for being here. It's been terrific. Thank you all for coming.